Hi everyone, welcome back to our last session at the Mac Kids Streaming Schoolhouse. I am Katie Halata and I work in the School and Library Marketing Department at Macmillan Children's Publishing Group. Today at the Streaming Schoolhouse, we have two guest teachers who are here to teach us some lessons in language arts. We have authors Remy Lai and Christian McKay Heidecker here with us today. Give a wave, guys. You can say hello if you're unmuted. Hello, hello. Hey. Hi, everyone. Uh, before I turn things over to our two guest teachers, I do have just a few housekeeping things to go over with everyone who's in the audience. First, if you're new to Zoom webinars, if this is the first time you are joining us, just know that the only people you'll be able to hear and see are myself and Christian and Remy. We won't be able to hear and see you, and you won't be able to hear or see your fellow attendees. So you don't need to worry about any audio or visual interference coming through during the sessions. If you are having any tech issues, if at any point during the presentations you can't hear us or see us, you can use that Q&A button that you see at the bottom of your screen to send a text message to one of our staff members and they'll be in touch directly to help um, troubleshoot any issues that you might be having. We do ask that if you are having tech issues while the authors are presenting that you just use that box for any video or audio questions and just note that you won't be able to chat with your fellow attendees using that feature. Once Remy and Christian are done with their presentations, we are going to open things up to the audience. We are going to, uh, for questions, Again, we'll be using that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen for you to type out your questions for Remy and Christian, which I'll then read aloud for everyone. If you're a young reader who has a question for one of our authors and you think you might need some help typing out your question, you'll have plenty of time to ask a parent or guardian for help. If you are a young reader who's gonna send in a question, we do ask that you include your first name only as, as well as your age so that we can prioritize some of those kid, kid questions for our teachers. This session is being recorded. So at the end of our streaming schoolhouse time, we are gonna uh, send out an email to everyone who's registered for any of the four sessions with a link to video recordings. Um, so if you're having those tech issues and for some reason we're unable to help you troubleshoot the problem, know that this is being recorded and will be made wildly available um, to anyone who registered as well as through some of our other social channels. So if you do have those tech issues, just rest assured that you will not be missing out on any of the fun. Finally, and most importantly, I do just want everyone in the audience to know that at Macmillan, we expect all participants to maintain an atmosphere of respect and fairness. Anyone who violates this standard of behavior, including engaging in any form of harassment, may at the discretion of the organizers be immediately removed from the event. And so now without any further ado, I am gonna turn things over to our first uh, guest teacher of the day, author Remy Lai. Remy has studied fine art with a major in painting and drawing. She was born in Indonesia, grew up in Singapore, and currently lives in Brisbane, Australia, where she writes and draws stories for kids with her two dogs by her side. She is the author of the critically acclaimed Pie in the Sky and the forthcoming Fly on the Wall. Take it away, Remy. Thank you. Oops. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, I think it's about one o'clock over there in New York. Um, and um, right now over here, it's uh, 3 a.m. on a Friday, <laughs> so I'm up really early. Um, yeah, and um, I'm in Australia, by the way, and um, I'm going to talk to you today about um, using um, your life as an inspiration when you write your stories. And um, I'm going to use also my books as an example. So. Um, my first book is um, Pie in the Sky, and it's about these two brothers who moved to Australia, but they can't speak English. So a lot of the things in this book were borrowed from my own life. So when you're writing about your own life, you can, you can think about um, the big events in your life and, and try to see how you can maybe make them into, your, into a, a fiction. And for example, um, the story about these boys was inspired by my own life because I also, I only learned English when I was about nine years old. And, um, okay, I'm going to start sharing the whiteboard because I'm going to doodle as I talk because that's just how I, my brain thinks. I kind of, I like to talk and doodle and listen and doodle at the same time. So, am I looking at the whiteboard? Yes. Okay, so this, I'm going to draw me, this is me right now, 
and my hair is really long because I haven't been able to go to the hairdressers for a long time. <laughs> Messy. And um, yeah, so when I was about um, nine years old, so I probably look like that I didn't have glasses then and I have a really I had a really great haircut which looks like a bowl like that and that's me so when I was about nine years old um I was born in Indonesia and I was when I was about nine I moved to Singapore where they use English so that was when I first learned English and so so that part of the story was I borrowed it I put it into pie in the sky and um and let's see. So that was a big thing that I put into the story. So you can think about a big event in your life. Maybe I don't know. Maybe if you if you go on a holiday somewhere really cool. Uh, maybe you went to Disneyland. Maybe you can write about that. And um, but you can also talk about little things. Uh, think about the little things that happen in your life, and then. Um, put it into your story. So for example, in this book, um, the, the two brothers, they can't speak English and um, they, but they improved their English by reading lots of English books. And one of the books that they read was a book called, called, let me see. Let's see, it was a book called, Sorry, I can't see the whiteboard. Yeah, it was a book called The Little Prince. It's about a prince um, from outer space, and but he's stranded on Earth and he's trying to go home. So that that kind of fit nicely into the into this book because they, they also miss their old home. And that part is a true story because I'm I'm going to show you here first, share. So this is a copy that I've had since I was about 10 years old. And in Pie in the Sky, what the brother did was when he's reading the book, he, there are many English words that he doesn't know. So what he does is he looks them up, looks up the meanings of the words in the dictionary, and then he writes, he writes the meanings of the words in the margins of the book. And I'm going to show you that I don't know if you can see it, but I wrote down the meanings of the words that I didn't know. So you can see there, I didn't know the meaning of desire here when I was about 10, desire. So my handwriting then was at 10 years old, was still really nice and neat. It has gone a lot downhill since then. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna share the whiteboard again. So, and another um, event in the book is, this is a spoiler, but at the end, um, the, the older brother leaves the younger brother behind at the bus station, and he ended up um, be, he ended up being at a, getting, ended up at the police station, because the, the police thought that he was a lost or missing kid. Um, so that one is also a true story. So when I was about um, 11, when I was about 11, I still kind of, I still look like that at 11. Um, my sister, who, my older sister, who was, I think, 15, and she, she, had, she had a better haircut than me then. So she looked kind of like that, maybe. And um, we had a quarrel. Um, I, I, we had a fight about something. And then she left me behind at a bus station, and um, and yeah, the police thought that I was a I was a lost kid, and they took me to the police station. So when I was riding when I was riding Pine the Sky, I called up my sister and asked her, um, "Hey, why did you leave me behind at the bus station?" And she doesn't really remember, but uh, yeah, she remembers getting getting scolded by my mom for leaving me behind at the bus station. Yeah, and one. I also like to um, use people I know to help me with character designs. Um, so for example, Yang Hao here. Yang Hao looks like that. Yang Hao is the younger brother and he looks like kind of like short hair, 
and he looks really cheeky like that. Um, so he's actually inspired by my nephew who is about eight or I think he's nine this year. And um, yeah, he's very cheeky and all that. And, and I also put people I know into my books as like the, the other characters in the background. Like I think um, my, my agent, is in the book. He's um, the bearded guy on the bus, so you can see him there. And um, oh, and um, so one of the questions that uh, when I whenever I go to schools, um, one of the questions that the kids ask a lot is whether whether I bake because in this book, um, the boys they bake a lot of cakes to cope with their loneliness, and because their family used to own a cake shop. And yeah, so kids ask me if I bake, and um, that part is kind of borrowed from my own life because I, I used to bake quite a bit, um, but then I had to stop because I started eating um, cake for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, which isn't very good for you. I mean, I, I wish it was good for us, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, so, but I knew a little bit about baking from my own life, but um, I didn't know, like, I wasn't an expert baker or anything, so I did have to do a lot of research into it also. Um, yeah, researching cakes is really fun. Yeah. So you can borrow something from your own life that you know about, but maybe you don't have to be an expert about it because you can still do research about it and then add that to your story. And so I talked a little bit earlier about how you use big events in your life or small funny events in your life and adding them into your story. But you can also use like a specific, uh, like not a, an event, but, like, but a feeling maybe, a feeling about something. So for example, um, in the in this book, there are two brothers, and the younger brother is always annoying the older one. So I I borrowed that from my own relationship with my siblings because I have I have four siblings, so they they annoy me all the time. So I put that that kind of feeling of being annoyed by younger brothers yeah and older sisters into the book, and um, I also did that with my second book here, my second book which is coming out in September, and. It's about this boy, Henry Koo, who goes on, he, who, whose family treats him like a baby. So that, that's, not, that's not really inspired by my life because my family, they don't treat me like a baby. They give me a lot of freedom. Uh, but for him to prove to his family that he's not a baby anymore, what he does is he goes on an international flight on his own from Australia to Singapore to prove to his parents that he's not a baby anymore. So that is also not true. I wasn't, I wasn't that adventurous as a kid. Um, but this book is really about a kid who feels like he's an intro, like he's weird, he's introverted, he doesn't really fit in, he has friendship troubles. So, so but, and I, that is a feeling that I know really well about. So um, I put that into my book, Into Flower the Wall. And also, um, And let me see. And I'm currently actually drawing um, a graphic novel about a dog, and I'm gonna I'll have to draw this one. So my dog, um, my I have two dogs. So my dog, one of them, they're currently sleeping right now. Um, so one of my dogs look like that. He's brown and white, and the other one is scruffy. And he looks like that. He's very scruffy. And he's grumpy. Um, yeah, so, but, um, so in the book that, in the graphic novel that I'm drawing, it's about a dog who goes shopping. That's not, that's not really, it's not based on real, on my own life because my, my dog is not, I'm not smart enough to train my dog to go shopping. Um, but I do base how, um, the friendship between the, bo the, the dog and the main character on my friendship with my dog. And I, also, and I also use my own dog as a model for this graphic novel. So in the graphic novel, the dog kind of looks like this. It, it kind of looks like my dogs, but with like longer ears. So it kind of like that. Yeah. So that was how, that is how I use kind of my own life as an inspiration for this book. And um, just another thing about 
about writing um, using your own life as an inspiration is you can think, you can start off by thinking about what you like. So for example, maybe you like, if you like cakes, you can write a book about cakes or something you like to, or if you like dinosaurs, you can write about dinosaurs um, because the things that you like, you tend to know a lot about just naturally because you're interested in them. Yeah, and then you can use that as a starting point to, um, to write your story. Yeah, and I think, I think that's, that's it for me. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to have him, oops. I can't. Okay, thank you everyone. I'm gonna start sharing. Thank you, Remy, that was awesome. And thank you also for being up so early. I am not a morning person, so I think that that is a real feat of dedication and I'm sure our young readers are appreciative of you being here as well. Um, we are now gonna uh, switch things over to our second teacher of the day, Christian McKay Heidegger. Christian reads and writes and drinks tea. Between his demon hunting cat and his fiddling redheaded girlfriend, he feels completely protected from evil spirits. Christian is the author of the Newbery Honor book, Scary Stories for Young Foxes, and the co-author of Thieves of Weirdwood. He lives in Salt Lake City, Utah. Christian, take it away. Hello, thank you so much for having me, you guys. Rebby, I love that relic of uh, your copy of The Little Prince with all of the definitions in there. That's one of the more beautiful things I've seen in a long time. I'm also glad that if that's you at 3 a.m. that you weren't at like full force or else I wouldn't have been able to follow that act because I really can't draw. <laughs> I, yeah, so um, I thought today that I would start out by telling you a very quick story about myself. And within this story is a deep lesson and I wanna see if you can figure out what that lesson is before I finish it. So uh, about a year ago, last June, uh, I was going to visit my girlfriend who was mentioned in the bio, who is now my fiance, because it was her birthday and I was going to spoil her. And when I got there, uh, her daughters who were four and six years old were right outside of her apartment because they had just bought this brand new ball from Target. And uh, they were really excited and they were playing catch. And if you have ever seen a four and a six year old play catch, they can't at all. <laughs> they were really, really bad at it. For example, one of them would like, you know, try to throw it and they'd be like, ah! and then it would like go like land one foot directly in front of them. And then if like they did manage to throw it, then, you know, the other one would like go to catch it and miss and it would hit them directly in the face. And uh, it, was, it was really, really hard to watch. Uh, but apparently uh, it was even harder for them to uh, experience because every time the ball didn't go where they wanted it to, or, you know, they couldn't catch it at all, they would throw like, the most cartoonish fit like they would they would miss the ball and then fold their arms and then turn around and then like droop over and just like the most dramatic thing you've ever seen in your entire life in fact at one point the four-year-old um like did the whole thing like crossed her arms and turned around and drooped and then she just like fell over like a, a dropped rag doll. She just collapsed to the ground. And so, you know, I'm like about to become their stepdad. So I was like, mm, I'm gonna teach them a lesson. You know, I'm gonna like show them what they look like cause that will be pretty funny. Uh, so it didn't take long uh, for them to start throwing the ball back and forth between them without including me whatsoever. And uh, so I was like, aha. This is the perfect opportunity. So I went, you guys are passing the ball to me. And I crossed my arms and I turned around and I drooped. And Hannah, my fiance, uh, told me about this later. 
She said, I committed to this role so hard that I looked like a zombie in a zombie film that had just been shot in the head. Like that's how much I committed to just falling over in absolute despair. I broke a rib when I fell. I actually cracked this rib right here. I can still feel it. It still hurts uh, because I, I am a lot higher off the ground than a four-year-old. <laughs> She's like, uh, comes up to my hip. I weigh a lot more. I landed on a rock and I'm old. So my bones are brittle. Uh, it, it was, it was really terrible. And I like, you know, had to, I even lost my breath for a while and it was like a really long recovery and I almost passed out. Um, and, uh, yeah, if, if you're playing at home, you might see the lesson that's buried inside of this story. And that lesson so clearly is never teach kids lessons ever. I'm just kidding. That's not actually <laughs> the lesson. But uh, uh, the reason, the real reason that I'm telling you this story today is because that tiny thing that happened to me actually has all of the ingredients of a great story. And I mean that it has the same ingredients as every book and movie and TV show that you watch all the time as the same ingredients as Lord of the Rings and as Star Wars and as Harry Potter. And that probably sounds really ridiculous because it's such a tiny little thing, right? Like it's this little thing that happened to me last year. But if we look at just how the events played out and uh, I, how I responded and, and how I was in those moments, they are all the same. And I am going to show you how. So, um, people who are much, much, is that clear? Can you guys see that? My audience on the side? Okay, awesome. People who are much smarter than I am uh, spent years and decades uh, reading all of the major stories that could be found from around the world. They read myths, they read folk tales, they read novels, they listened to just vocal storytelling traditions, and they noticed that humans tend to tell stories the same way every single time. There are, of course, exceptions. There are little ways that they can change, but the basic shape of a story is almost always the same, shockingly. You can look at it, uh, you can call it the hero's journey, you can call it story circles, uh, but if you start to tune in to the events that happen in a story, you'll start to notice that they're all the same. So I'm going to take you through this really quickly. I found this very, very lovely uh, kid-friendly graphic, and uh, then I'm going to show you how it applies to my story, and then we're going to look at how it applies to big blockbusters that you go and see in movies, and then I'm going to show you how you can use it for your stories, whether you're writing one or telling one or anything. So, uh, right here at the top, I, this is, uh, we're going to start at 12 o'clock, uh, if this were a clock, and we're going to work our way around to the right clockwise. So you're going to introduce a hero that your audience can relate to, right? So uh, does this person really love chocolate milk? Does this person, or is this person really, really nice to other people? Does this person get embarrassed around their parents? Like, what's something that will make them like the characters that they want to be a part of their life for, you know, however long the movie or the book or your story is. Um, but this character has a burning need for something, right? They want something. They, they uh, feel incomplete. Like they may be in a comfortable position in their life when it starts, but they really, really are missing something. Um, so they enter an unfamiliar world. Right? They venture out. Like all of the great stories have to do with something brand new happening. And whether that means like leaving your hometown and 
going to a fantasy world or Detroit, I don't know, or if something new comes to your town, right, and mixes things up and things are, are very different. I, I, obviously, in, in Remy's story, her characters move to a new country, right? Like, that's very unfamiliar and just filled with challenges and, and new things. Um, they face great jeopardy on their search, right? Like getting left behind at a bus stop, for example. <laughs> uh, or, you know, they, they, they face dragons or they face uh, just all of the unknowns of the world and they get to know them and they figure out how uh, they can survive in this new place. They find what they want is the next step. And that might seem pretty surprising. It's always surprising to me because I always think that a character uh, is going to find what they want at the end of the story, right? We're going to come back to that, but just keep in mind that this point, around halfway through your story, they find that thing that they had a burning desire for. We come back here, she's imagining a sword. Right down here, she gets that sword. Uh, but then they realize what really matters, uh, and they return to their old life, uh, a fundamentally changed person right? And that completes the cycle. And uh, this is pretty simple, right? I mean, I just took you through eight very short steps. And they might be kind of hard to remember, but if you keep looking at them, then they'll start to sink in. And uh, I, if you watch movies uh, and think about all of the steps that this takes, if you read books and think about all the steps this takes, they do the same thing every time. It's amazing. Really quickly, I am going to run uh, you through why my story <laughs> applies to this circle, and I'll do it very quickly. So you introduce uh, a hero your audience can relate to, right? So uh, I am a person who is frustrated that uh, these uh, kids uh, can't play catch very well or are getting <laughs> frustrated. I think we've all been in that position, having someone who's younger than we are maybe not be so great, you know? That's why we leave them at the bus stop. Sorry, Remy, spoiler alert, that's why it happened. Um, and I had a burning need for something, which was that I wanted to connect to my soon-to-be stepdaughters, right? I wanted to be like the stepfather and, and you know, like there's, there's uh, a pride in me. <laughs> so I'd enter an unfamiliar world uh, which is uh, playing catch with a four and a six-year-old. I've never played catch with them before. Now, how unfamiliar is it? Not that unfamiliar, but you can see how in the trajectory of my day, this is a new situation. And I face great jeopardy, right? They're bad at throwing. They could hit me in the face. Uh, they could also not throw to me and it would hurt my feelings. And uh, yeah, it's too bad. I get an opportunity to play stepdad for a second. I get to be like, hey guys, pouting is not gonna make you very good at throwing and I'm gonna show you how ridiculous you are, right? Like this is me being a stepfather by like doing all the same things that you did and uh, breaking my rib. This line right here, in any story, right around seven o'clock is where your character will have something terrible happen to them. Go ahead and watch all of the Pixar movies, watch all of the Marvel movies, watch all of the Disney movies, take all of your graphic novels and all of your books off the shelf and look at about seven tenths of the way through the story uh, or you know, a little more than two thirds. Probably something really bad is happening to the character. That's where someone dies. That's where someone uh, breaks an arm. That's where someone feels like they will never ever win, win the talent show. And that's when I broke a rib. I, that actually helped me realize that maybe uh, making fun of my stepdaughters is not the best way to go <laughs> about connecting with them, right? Just playing catch with them and, and being there and hanging out with them is what's really important. And I returned to my old life on the dragon with the sword or really equipped with this new idea of how to be a better representation to the stepdaughters uh, having changed, right? Which is like how I 
ridiculously ended that story earlier by saying, uh, never teach kids lessons ever. <laughs> so that is the full cycle. And uh, I can take you through uh, Lord of the Rings, right? Where you have Frodo, who's just kind of like this very helpless uh, character in a, in a very wide world uh, who wants to go on an adventure. Uh, they get the, he gets the ring and he has to set out. He's in great jeopardy uh, as he goes. Uh, finding what he wants, I mean, he goes on the adventure and he also gets the fellowship together, right? And they're all united. Pay a heavy price, like some of the fellowship die and they break up and they, uh, Frodo has to set off alone and learns, you know, fundamentally how to, um, uh, how to not desire adventure, how to be simple, and returns to the Shire in the end, having changed. Now, uh, what I just threw at you, how am I for time, by the way? I should probably look at that really quickly. Oh, uh, two minutes. Okay. Oh, I might actually be done. Oh, no, no. I got, I got about two minutes. Okay, cool. Um, so really quickly, uh, I am going to spend those last two minutes showing you how you can make a simple version of this for yourself. But in order to do that, I need to be able to draw a good circle. Remy, I wish you were here. Okay. So you start by drawing a plain circle. You divide it in half, straight up and down. Oh, I'm running out of ink. This is not the best time for that. Like that. And then you divide it in half crossways, like so. Then you're going to divide it in half two more times so that you have eight slices of pie, we'll say. Right at the top, you can write along with me here and I'll show you it in the, in the end. Christian, you're gonna write want, comfort. Oh yes, please. I don't wanna interrupt you, but I think it would be easier for our attendees to see what you're drawing if you unshared your screen so that you took up the whole oh, screen. Oh, hey. Yeah, Thank I think you. they'll yeah, see that's, it better. That's smart. Uh, I can't, um, I, it says I'm not sharing my screen. Nope, you are now, this is perfect. So I think oh, if you just great. hold it up, everyone should be able to see it now. Marvelous. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. So we have this uh, circle that has eight slices. And at the very top, we have comfort. The character is in a position of comfort, but they want something. Speaking of handwriting that is degraded over time, they enter a new situation right here. And then they learn how to adapt to that new situation. That's step four. They get what they wanted in the first place so that we can see what they look like when they get the thing that they want. They pay a heavy price for getting that thing. Finally, they return to where they came from, having changed fundamentally. Write that down, think about it, and start paying attention to that whenever, it's usually easiest when you watch a movie because it all happens so fast. And my favorite anchor point is to look at the very, very middle of the movie like to the minute and see what's happening there and is the character actually getting what they want? Did they get the Infinity Gauntlet? Did they defeat Thanos? Did something huge happen? And then see the darkness that comes from that and all of those. Anyway, that's Story Circles. Thank you very much for having me, you guys. Christian, thank you. That was so fabulous. Um, we are going to move into the Q&A portion of our session right now. So if you do have a question for Remy or Christian, you're going to be able to use that Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen. Type in your question and then we'll be reading them aloud for everyone to hear as we go on. If you're a young reader who has a question for one of our authors, just rem and you might need some help typing your, um, your question out, you'll have plenty of time right now to ask a parent or guardian from assistant. And if you could just remember to include your name and your age so that we can help prioritize those kid questions to the top of the queue, that would be so helpful. We are gonna start things off while everyone is typing out their questions with a question that a reader sent in in advance of this session um, to kick things off. 
So you guys over the course of this session have given everyone some really great ideas on how to start a story of their own and you know inspire them to, to think of some ideas. Um, but this young reader would like to know if you have any advice to give to children to help improve their writing skills. Remy? Whoever wants to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, my advice would be to read a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's my advice. And um, read the books that you like to read and sometimes try books that maybe you wouldn't pick up. So maybe if you if you if you've always been reading um, like fiction, maybe you could try some nonfiction um, and see how that goes. Yeah, Christian. Yeah, I I second that for sure. I also think that it's it's it really helps not to worry about it. I you know you can worry over how your writing sounds and and uh, you can definitely make improvements, but so long as you're enjoying it and you're telling a story that you're really really excited about then the language will follow you might have to write a lot of really uh terrible things first uh but uh i don't know if remy's anything like me i wrote a lot of terrible things first <laughs> so it's and that's okay uh let yourself off the hook you don't you don't have to stress too much about how the writing sounds just enjoy the process that is very good advice um, we have a question now from Berkeley, who is age six. They would like to know, what is your favorite step of the storytelling cycle? Um, Christian, you obviously shared the cycle with us, but you can definitely both answer. I, so so I, I am fascinated by, by the part where, uh, great question for age six, by the way. I, I, I'm really fascinated by the part where the character gets what they want, you know? Because I had always thought in my head, like, stories... Uh, end when the character gets what they want. And when it was, I, when I realized that that often happens at the dead center of the story, then I was like, oh, so what happens after that? <laughs> you know, that's, that's really, really interesting to me. I've also found that the middles of stories can get really bad. People write bad middles because they've got a really exciting beginning and a really exciting ending and the middle just gets like murky and muddy. And this uh, like shines a lot of light uh, there and it makes it a lot more interesting. So I think that's, that's my, favorite, my favorite step. Yeah, I also, I also like the midpoint. I think it's the most exciting and also could be the hardest to write, I feel. <laughs> yeah, um, yep. usually sometimes when I write, I don't even know what is the midpoint. I have to think about that later, but usually I only know the beginning and the end and then the middle uh, I have to worry about it and then um, yeah <laughs> all right um, Emmy who is age eight would like to know how do you plan your writing like do you have an outline do you have any any tools like that um, I, I, I do use, I do have an outline. So I usually have an idea in my head. I don't have it here with me. So, but I carry a journal, a sketchbook or notebook around everywhere. And I write down all my ideas in there. Like even ideas that sometimes don't make sense or, and, and then later you find out that they still don't make sense. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but I do, also, I write an outline. I normally know what is the ending and the beginning when I start writing but I think I tend to write in my, in my head a lot first before I start actually putting um, pen to paper. Yeah. But I do like an outline just so that I know where I'm going instead of just writing a million words that goes nowhere. But I feel, but I have written a million words that goes nowhere before. Um, so I think it's kind of important um, when you're starting out to, to find out what kind of a writer you are, because some people don't use outlines and that's fine, you just write the way that you write. Yeah. I, uh, I, they always talk about uh, whether authors are plotters or pantsers, uh, which means like you do a lot of plotting or pantsing is uh, not what it sounds like. It's when you write by the seat of your pants, right? Like you're just making it up as you go along and you don't think about structure or anything. And I have become an avid planter where I create a plot 
and then I'm ready to throw it away at any point during the writing process. It's maybe the most difficult way to go, and I don't rec <laughs> I don't recommend it. I, I second Remy's idea that like you have to figure out what kind you are. Maybe you just sit down and just hack it out, and maybe you think for a very long time about how it goes. All right, our next question is from Elena, who is in sixth grade. She'd like to know what inspires you to write. Christian? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I just, you know, these, these worlds and ideas bloom in my head and they have ever since I was very young and I have to get them out. Um, I really, really have to. Uh, writing is of course extremely difficult and I, so the other thing that inspires me to write and work really hard today is that I do not want to work in an office. I want to, <laughs> I want to be here at home with my cat. Uh, those are my two biggest inspirations. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I also want to be home. Not with, I don't have cats, but I've got dogs. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I want to, uh, but... Uh, yeah, I've always wanted to tell stories since I was a kid. Um, so I have four siblings, but I, I remember when I was a kid that there was always noise and activity all around my house. It's always really noisy. But I, I remember when I, um, I would sneak off somewhere to read or just, just be away from them. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think that's what started. And then I read a lot and then I guess that kind of inspires me to write something you know, to, to have to write for kids something that, that, you know, that's kind of like the, what books meant to me as a kid. I wanted to also do that for other kids. But, but, me, but mostly is for a selfish reason is because I, I like writing. Yeah. All right. This is going to be our last question. It is from Rachel, who is eight years old, and she would like to know, can you read too much? <laughs> I, 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 I want to say no, but my mom would probably say yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, because when I was a kid, I would read all the time um, during dinner or in class or whatever. Um, yeah, so my mom probably say yes, but I, I want to say no. <laughs> <laughs> I read more than anyone I know, and that includes like audiobooks in the headphones when I'm like, brushing my teeth or doing the dishes. I, I try to bring in as much as I possibly can. I do think that, I don't know how much you're reading, but I do think that real life experiences will make you a well-balanced uh, author. Uh, so if you do feel like you're reading like an exhausting amount, uh, I don't know, you're probably reading just enough. Like I, I'm sure you're reading just fine, but just make sure to go out and you know, stub your toe and get your heart broken and fail at things because, uh, because sometimes when we try to uh, impersonate emotions that we've read in books, uh, they can seem like shadows of those emotions. They can seem like they're not very real as opposed to something that we really, really experienced, you know? And I think that Remy gave a lot of really good examples of that today. Um, that being said, Ray Bradbury did nothing but read for his entire life, and uh, he's amazing, and his stories are perfect. So, I, oh. <laughs> all right. Well, that brings us to the end of our language arts session. Thank you so much to our guest teachers today, to Christian and to Remy. Thank you for everyone who joined us, not only for today, but for our sessions throughout the week. This is our last streaming schoolhouse session for the week, um, and we've oh. been delighted to be spending the afternoon with you guys. Uh, just a reminder again that these sessions have been recorded, so as soon as the videos are available, we are going to be sending them out to all the registered attendees. Um, we're also going to include in that email some more details about Christian and Remy's books and where you might be able to find them at your local bookstores or borrow them through your local libraries. Um, and stay tuned for more virtual events from Mac Kids. All right, thank you guys. Bye, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Bye.